2015 Nobel Prize in Physics, where we were awarded to Takaaki Kajita, and he is one of the principal investigators at the Cavalier Institute for Physics and Mathematics at the Universe, and he has been also a long-time friend, working together on neutrino physics for many years, so I'm very happy to hear this announcement. So what he discovered uh, to get Nobel Prize for is the discovery of the mass of neutrinos. So you may be wondering, you know, what are the neutrinos and why it's so exciting to discover mass of the neutrinos? After all, don't every matter particles have mass at some level? So I'd like to explain these things to you. First of all, neutrinos are everywhere. Even if you go to empty space out there, you're going to find about 300 neutrinos per cubic centimeter. They come from the Big Bang. And tons of them come from the sun. So as I speak, some trillions of neutrinos are passing through my body every second. And even during the night, when the sun is on the other side of the Earth, the entire planet Earth is kind of transparent to neutrinos. They are so shy, they don't interact very much, but they can pass through the entire planet very easily. So even during the evening, trillions of neutrinos are going through my body anyway. So they are very shy, it doesn't have electricity and very, very light. So that's what neutrinos are. But it has been believed for many decades that these neutrinos don't have any mass at all. Over a century, in the 20th century, we've been building a theory called the standard model of particle physics. And in this theory, neutrinos do not have any mass at all. Zero. And there's a reason for that. So when people looked at neutrinos, it's very difficult to study because they're so shy, it's very difficult to catch them. But whenever they did, neutrinos have been always left-handed. What that means is that if the neutron is traveling this way, it's actually spinning always counterclockwise. Then we say the particle is left-handed. Every single neutrino people have seen have been left-handed. And what that means is that neutrinos cannot have any mass at all. And this is the reason. So if the neutrino has any just a tiny bit of mass, then it cannot catch up with the speed of light. It is always a little bit slower than that. So if the neutrino is going at a speed which is a little bit slower than the speed of light, then something else might go actually faster than it and can look back at the neutrino. Then from that object, neutrino looks like it's going backwards, but still is spinning the same way. So neutrino will be seen as something right-handed that's spinning clockwise. But nobody has seen such a particle. So then people concluded, well, if nobody has seen a right-handed neutrino, then it must be impossible to overtake it. It must be going at the speed of light. And if it's going with the speed of light, it cannot have any mass at all. Therefore, neutrino does not have any mass. And that's the way the standard model had been constructed. And the reason uh, uh, the way that Takaki Kajita and his collaborators discovered the mass of the neutrino is also very interesting. Imagine you go to an ice cream shop. You order a uh, strawberry ice cream in a waffle cone. At this ice cream shop, they actually throw the ice cream at you. They don't hand it over to you. So as you watch, strawberry ice cream comes through the air, then you get surprised that it turns into chocolate. But it comes back to strawberry, and turns back in chocolate again, and so on. And when it actually reaches your hand, you get chocolate and strawberry half and half in the waffle cone. So what Kajita discovered is something like that. So what he studied is a particular type of neutrinos called muon neutrinos. They are actually three types of neutrinos, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. And these muon neutrinos are made in the atmosphere all the time. So our planet Earth is bombarded by something called cosmic rays all the time. And when the cosmic rays hit nitrogen, oxygen, nuclei in the atmosphere, they produce these muon neutrinos. And they also built humongous detectors to study this. Because neutrinos are so shy, you need to build a huge target to get any detection of neutrinos at all. So they, they were built a water tank that's something like 15 stories high and, and about the same width. And this big water tank, they have 50,000 tons of water. And with this huge target, they still see only like two neutrinos a day. But nonetheless, they managed to study them. And this is what they discovered. 
those neutrons coming from above, they have only about 20 kilometers of travel, and nothing happened to them. But those neutrons coming from the other side of the Earth, they travel through the diameter of the Earth over um, uh, 12,000 kilometers, and it looked like a half of the muon neutrinos have been lost. So it turned out, it's the same as ice cream I mentioned to you. Muon neutrinos turned into tau neutrinos, back to muon neutrinos, again to tau neutrinos, and so on. As they keep going back and forth, when they got into this detector at the end of the day, they have seen half muon neutrinos and half tau neutrinos. And tau neutrinos are very difficult to see. So that's why they thought half the muon neutrinos have been lost. What this means is that neutrinos sense time. Those coming from above didn't have much time to travel. Those coming from below had a little bit more time to travel. But according to Einstein theory of relativity, anything that is going very fast would have their clocks slow down. If something is going at the speed of light, then clock completely stops, and then you don't sense time at all. So if the neutrons don't have any mass, then it should be traveling the speed of light, so neutrons don't sense time, their clock completely stops, then there's no difference between neutrons coming from above and those coming from below. But now that they discover they are different, they sense time, and therefore they can't be going at the speed of light, and therefore they should have mass. So that's what this experiment has discovered, and that's why it was so important. Neutrinos do have a tiny bit, but finite mass. And the reason why it's so important is that over a century or so, we've been building the standard model particle physics, which had been sort of completed in 2012 when the Higgs boson was discovered. So that was a moment of big celebration. But now this Nobel Prize this year is the first Nobel Prize in particle physics that demonstrated that the standard model particle physics is not complete. Still something's missing in there. We have to pursue a better theory that can also describe this newly found phenomenon of neutrino oscillation and therefore neutrino mass. But now that we know the neutron has mass, that is also a very exciting thing because it may be actually a evidence that neutrinos are kind of big father of us who protected us from complete annihilation. What I mean by this is the following. Now that neutrino is going at a speed, a little bit slower than speed of light, it's going counterclockwise. But if you overtake it, look back at it, it's going the other way. So now it looks like it's a right-handed particle. I mentioned that to you. But what could this right-handed particle be? We have seen right-handed electrical neutral part particle before that is anti-neutrino. So maybe that if there's a neutrino, but if you pass it, look back at it, it could be actually anti-neutrino. Neutrino is a matter particle, but if you pass it, look at it, it may become an anti-matter particle. So maybe for neutrinos, it's possible to go from matter to antimatter and vice versa. And that may be the reason why we exist in the universe today. So the universe started with this big bang that was a huge amount of energy. And energy turns into matter, but only together with the antimatter, one to one. But if it stayed that way, the universe expanded, cooled, and eventually matter and antimatter meet. Again, one to one, they annihilate back into energy, and we lose all of them. The universe would have been completely empty in that case. But you exist, I exist, we're made of matter, but there's no antimatter around us. So what must have happened then is that after equal amount of matter and antimatter had been created, maybe one out of the 10 million uh, antimatter got turned into matter. So there's a one part in billion difference between matter and antimatter. They're almost completely united with each other, but the two out of a billion remained today, and that's us. And if the neutrino and the antineutron can turn into uh, each other, then neutrino might have played the role of picking one out of a billion antimatter, turn that into matter, so that we could survive the Big Bang. This is a theory put forward by Fukugita and Yanagita at Cavity IPMU, and this theory became very plausible after Kajita's discovery of the mass of the neutrino. 
So what people are trying to do these days is to really look for this process that the neutrino might turn into antimatter or uh, uh, vice versa. So that's one search that's going on around the world today. And another thing people are trying to understand is if neutrinos and antimatter and neutrinos would behave in a slightly different way. So that there was a reason for the universe to pick a little bit more matter than antimatter so that we survived it. So this is the kind of research that is still going on today. There's still a lot of mysteries we'd like to understand about the neutrinos. So uh, there's a lot of excitement about this particle. We are still studying it.